Hey y'all, I'm Dr. Alice Hoyt, and I'm so glad you joined me today on Food Allergy and Your Kiddo Podcast. Today, we will be talking about the five myths that I most commonly see regarding food allergy testing. And before we get into that, I will also do a brief overview of what is a food allergy and what is not a food allergy. Let's dive in. Welcome to Food Allergy and Your Kiddo with Dr. Alice Hoyt, the podcast about demystifying food allergies, diminishing allergy anxiety, and taking back control. Let's navigate this challenge together with evidence-based information, scientific research, and tried and proven practices. And now, here's your host, board-certified allergist and immunologist specializing in food allergy, Dr. Alice Hoyt. Okay, so chances are that if you're listening to this podcast, you or someone you love, like your little sweet pea, has had or is going to have some sort of food allergy testing at an upcoming allergy appointment. It's important to know what testing helps diagnose what type of food allergy. So when I'm saying what type of food allergy, what am I talking about? There are different types of food allergies. Did you know that? I break down food allergies into about five different categories. There is anaphylactic or IgE-mediated food allergy, number one. Number two, there is EOE, eosinophilic esophagitis. Number three, food-induced flaring of atopic dermatitis and food-induced dermatitis. Number four, Food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome or FPIs. And then number five is not a food allergy, but I always include it when I'm talking about immune responses to foods, and that's celiac disease. So when you see an allergist and your question is, does sweet pea have a food allergy? The allergist is going to be thinking, one, was there a reaction to food? And two, what was that reaction? What was the timeline and what were the symptoms? And so the allergist is going to ask you questions along those lines. If food does seem to be playing a role, the allergist will likely be thinking, is the body attacking the food or is the food attacking the body? If the food's attacking the body, not really an immune response. An example of that would be food poisoning, Um, Also, a food intolerance, like lactose intolerance. With a lactose intolerance, what's happening is that the person's GI tract does not have the ability to break down the sugar found in milk, and that results in significant bellyache, gassiness, diarrhea. It can be very, very distressing, to say the least. Now, if the allergist suspects the immune system is playing a role, that's when the allergist is considering possible food allergy. I'll briefly describe those five immune responses to foods because it's relevant to the possible myths of food allergy testing. The most common type of food allergy you'll hear about is what I'll call classic food allergy or IgE mediated food allergy. You're like, what is IgE? IgE is short for immunoglobulin E. An immunoglobulin is also called an antibody. It's basically a protein, a part of your immune system that helps your immune system protect your body. IgE actually helps protect us against parasite infections. But for some reason, some people have started making IgE against things that it shouldn't, like against peanuts. There's no reason to make IgE to peanut because if you make IgE to peanut, then you're at risk of having an allergic reaction to peanut. Symptoms of an IgE mediated allergic reaction can include hives, swelling, trouble breathing, vomiting, drop in blood pressure, increase in heart rate. These symptoms come on pretty quickly, typically within a few moments, but definitely within a couple of hours. And symptoms resolve within 24 hours. So this is why if someone comes to me having hives for two weeks, I can pretty confidently tell them hives are very frustrating, but this is not being caused by a food. And then we'll talk about other causes of hives. The only way to treat an 
anaphylactic or that severe allergic reaction, the hive swelling, trouble breathing, vomiting, drop in blood pressure, potential death is with epinephrine. Epinephrine, when administered from an auto injector, is incredibly safe. So if you suspect somebody is having an allergic reaction and they are unable to give themselves their epinephrine auto injector, then you can administer it. And you can learn more about that at codeana.org, C-O-D-E-A-N-A.org. Epinephrine treats an anaphylactic reaction. What about these other food allergies? Let's talk more about those. So the second diagnosis of food allergy, different second type of food allergy I mentioned was eosinophilic esophagitis. EOE is a disease in which immune cells infiltrate the esophagus and damage the esophagus. So then you can have trouble swallowing and ultimately have pretty severe damage of your esophagus. The third type of food allergy I mentioned is food-induced flaring of atopic dermatitis. That's when somebody already has eczema or atopic dermatitis and certain foods like cow's milk might flare the eczema. Less common is allergic contact dermatitis due to food, which I won't go into in this podcast. The fourth diagnosis I mentioned was FPIES, food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome. That's typically in younger children and babies. And that's when they consume a food and for the first couple hours, they're fine, but then they have severe GI symptoms and look very, 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 very sick and typically have to go to the emergency room and have IV fluids to get them through the reaction. Identification of that triggering food is determined by a very thorough history that the allergist will take because allergy testing, skin prick and blood testing, is testing for IgE or the allergic antibody and FPI's reactions are not caused by IgE. So testing for IgE in that situation wouldn't be helpful. And again, FPI's is typically in younger kiddos, but it can be in older kiddos and even in adults. And the fifth diagnosis I mentioned, again, is not a food allergy. It is celiac disease, but I like to bring it up because it is an immune response to a food and it is different from wheat allergy. Celiac disease is an autoimmune reaction to gluten and it causes damage to your GI tract. It can cause you to have anemia, whereas wheat allergy is when you consume wheat and you have hive swelling, trouble breathing. That's that immediate or within a few moments to within a couple hours, as opposed to the celiac disease, which symptoms you may feel symptoms when you consume something that has gluten. Many people who have celiac disease, they can tell when they've accidentally ingested something that contains gluten, but their symptoms can persist for days, weeks, months. It can go on for years sometimes before people are diagnosed. So with so many different types of immune responses to foods, I hope it's becoming clearer as to why there's not one type of test for all these different types of food allergies or immune responses to foods. Okay, let's get to those myths. Counting down, myth number five. Allergy blood testing is better than allergy skin testing. That is a myth. Blood testing and skin testing often agree, meaning if one is positive, then the other is positive, but that's not always the case. And depending on your allergist, your allergist may rely more heavily on one type of testing compared to the other. That can be because of their clinical experience. That might be because of the actual disease process that they're considering, what type of food allergy they're considering. But ultimately, Both tests are testing for IgE. They're testing for that allergic antibody that hangs out on your allergy cells that allows an allergic reaction to occur. A skin test, an allergy skin test, is going to tell us whether or not the person has those allergic antibodies on their allergy cells. An allergy blood test is going to tell us how much allergic antibody is hanging out in the person's bloodstream. 
So both are looking for allergic antibody, but they're doing it in different ways. So is one type of testing better than the other? Not necessarily. Let's keep going. Myth number four. IgG testing is just as good as IgE testing for allergies. That is absolutely not true. Um, IgG is a type of antibody, but it does not activate allergy cells like does IgE. And actually, we think that when somebody has IgG to peanut or any other food, what it's really telling us is that they've been exposed to it, that that they've seen it and their immune system's kind of taken a picture of it and, and, and there you go. But what does it actually mean? Well, it's, it's not activating allergy cells to have that allergic, high swelling, trouble breathing reaction. Now that you know this, it probably doesn't surprise you that there's no evidence to performing IgG testing if you're looking for food allergy. Or maybe you're thinking, but Dr. Hoyt, does IgG testing help diagnose food intolerance? There is no evidence for that either, which I'm guessing some of you listening are like, oh my gosh, that $499 I spent on that internet IgG testing, why did I do that? It's very frustrating because there's no evidence for that. And that's one of the reasons I'm doing this podcast is to help dispel these myths that not only result in poor information, but also cost you money. It's very frustrating. Ugh, it's very frustrating. Let's move along. Myth number three. Allergy testing can only be done in certain age groups. Dr. Hoyt, I've heard that my child is too young to have allergy testing. That is not the case. Allergy testing can be done at any age. It's just a matter of when should it be done? When is there evidence to do this type of testing? Food allergy testing certainly is performed in infancy, especially in the case of possible peanut allergy. If you've read my blog, then you've come across the LEAP study learning early about peanut and LEAP1. These studies showed that early introduction of peanut in babies 4 to 11 months of age who were at risk of peanut allergy resulted in decreased peanut allergy. So how do you know if a baby's at risk of peanut allergy? A baby is at risk of peanut allergy if they have one of two things. One, they have severe eczema, or two, they have an egg allergy. Now, how do you know if your four-month-old baby has an egg allergy? You don't because your four-month-old baby has not yet had scrambled eggs, right? They shouldn't have. That's too early. That's too early because of developmentally, they can't handle that texture. Could they have severe eczema by then? Absolutely. So in that case, if a four-month-old baby comes to my office and has severe eczema and mom's worried that something in her breast milk is causing the baby's eczema, I will certainly discuss that with the kiddo's mom, but then I'm also going to talk about because the kiddo has severe eczema, the kiddo is at risk of peanut allergy. And I'd likely recommend that we evaluate the kiddo for peanut allergy. So ultimately, allergy testing can be done at any age, but you want to have a specific evidence-based indication for doing the testing. Myth number two. We're getting close to number one, y'all. Myth number two. Allergy testing should be done to determine the cause of eczema in babies. No, 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 no. Eczema is also called atopic dermatitis. It's a skin disorder in which the skin barrier is basically defective. The skin is our largest immune organ. So when the skin barrier is defective, then your immune system is interacting with the world in a way that it really shouldn't. Basically, when the skin barrier is defective and that immune system interacts inappropriately with the outside world, the result can be the development of those allergic antibodies, that IgE. The eczema is predisposing the kiddo to having food allergy. It's not that a certain food is causing the kiddo to have that eczema. Now you're going to say, but Dr. Hoyt, you talked about food-induced flaring of atopic dermatitis. Think of atopic dermatitis as the fire and think of a flaring food as gasoline. 
So gasoline itself is not on fire, but when you put gasoline on a fire, that fire gets worse. So gasoline did not cause the fire. Peanut did not cause the eczema. Cow's milk did not cause the eczema. But if somebody has eczema, it's possible that a food is worsening it. So then what do you do? Do you say, oh, well, well, my baby needs to avoid that food? Initially, your allergist may have you have sweet pea avoid that food for a week or so while you guys work together on a really great skincare regimen to calm down the eczema and then get that food back into the diet. Why it's important to get that food, in that example, cow's milk, back into the diet is because we know that the longer a kiddo is avoiding a food, the more likely they are to develop that anaphylactic food allergy. So in that case, the kiddo might just only have food-induced flaring of atopic dermatitis, but if they avoid the milk for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, they might actually develop IgE-mediated food allergy or anaphylactic food allergy. Getting back to the myth, can food allergy testing be done to determine the cause of eczema? No, because foods are not causing the eczema. Can foods flare eczema? Yes. Will some allergists do specific and limited testing to help guide the introduction of foods, especially in babies who have severe eczema, like with the LEAP study? like skin testing for peanut when a baby has severe eczema? Absolutely. Because it's that eczema that puts the baby at risk of the peanut allergy. But the take home message is that foods are not causing eczema. So doing food allergy testing to determine the cause of eczema, it's not gonna be helpful. I know this can be really confusing, right? That's why it's so important that you have this type of information and you have an allergist that you can really dive into all this with and, and talk about these things. But also that's why I'm doing this podcast so that you can submit your questions and, and I can dive into these things with you. And then you can take this information back and talk with your allergist about it. Okay, y'all, we're at myth number one. What do you think it is? If you think it's that allergy testing is 100% accurate for all food allergies, You would be correct. That is absolutely a myth. The reason I went through the different types of food allergies earlier in this podcast and why I kind of broke down what is a food allergy from what's a food intolerance and how the immune system can be attacking things or if it's like lactose intolerance, that's that's not an immune issue at all. The reason I went through all that is because it's important to know that not all food allergies are created equal. They're not all the same, so it makes sense that you're not going to use the same testing for all food allergy, right? For eosinophilic esophagitis, allergy testing, meaning skin prick testing, blood testing, hasn't really panned out to be helpful. Check out my info blog where I reference a study that suggests that kiddos who have eosinophilic esophagitis and have negative allergy testing to milk actually need to avoid milk as opposed to the kiddos who had some positive testing to milk. Kind of mind boggling? Yes and no. Yes, because if you're just thinking, oh, well, that food allergy test clearly wasn't very good, but not mind boggling if you treat these food allergies differently. And you should because they are different. Eosinophilic esophagitis is different from anaphylactic or IgE mediated food allergy is different from food-induced flaring of eczema is different from FPIs. And all of those are different from celiac disease, which is different from non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So no, allergy testing is not 100% accurate for all food allergies, but it's also not 100% accurate for IgE-mediated food allergy. Allergy testing only tells us part of the story. I want you to think of food allergy as as one of those balancing scales, you know, two sides. It's kind of like a, a teeter-totter. On one side, you have allergy, meaning allergic immune system. On the other side, you have an immune system full of t- 
tolerance. If you have more tolerance than you have allergy, very simply put, if you have more tolerance than you have allergy, tolerance will outweigh allergy and you won't be allergic. That means you can still have positive testing to a food, but if your immune system has a lot more components of tolerance, it's going to overcome that allergy. And that is an example of having positive testing but not being allergic. Well, Dr. Hoyt, what's the testing for tolerance? We don't have good testing for tolerance yet. Ultimately, the testing for allergy versus tolerance is going to be an ingestion challenge. I'm not going to dive too deep into an ingestion challenge today, but an ingestion challenge is actually the gold standard to diagnose food allergy, specifically that IgE-mediated anaphylactic food allergy. That's where you'll go into your allergist's office, you'll typically bring the food, the allergen in question with you, and your allergist will administer in sequential incremental amounts that food to your kiddo and monitor you for a few hours after that challenge to determine whether or not there was an allergic reaction. And basically, if if you've eaten the amount of that food that your allergist said would would trigger a reaction and you don't have a reaction, then you're not allergic, which is awesome, right? And again, that's another really important reason to see an allergist and ask about doing an ingestion challenge because even kiddos with positive testing can have negative challenges. We also do challenges for FPIs, but again, I'll talk about food challenges on a different podcast. That's the show, y'all. We've gone through those top five myths. We've talked about different types of food allergies. And I imagine you probably have more questions. So send them to me through my info blog, foodallergyandyourkiddo.com. And remember, I am an allergist, but I am not your allergist. So use this information to talk with your allergist. God bless you and God bless your family. Thanks for listening to this episode of Food Allergy and Your Kiddo with food allergist, Dr. Alice Hoyt. For more information on navigating the world of food allergy, visit www.foodallergyandyourkiddo.com and follow Dr. Hoyt on Twitter at Dr. Alice Hoyt. Remember to subscribe, rate, and review. Let's take the anxiety and confusion out of food allergy. 